I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome again to Get Used To It. This is our monthly discussion show about gay and lesbian issues, which we invite people from the community to talk about, oh, whatever we're talking about. And today we're talking about aging in our community. Um, recently, there was a conference at the University of Southern California called Diversity with a Difference, Serving Aging Gay Men and Lesbians. Uh, and it was sponsored by the American Society on Aging, their task force on lesbian and gay aging issues, and co-sponsored by the LA Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center. Uh, there were a number of wonderful panelists, and we're going to uh, let you hear what some of them had to say a little later in the show. Uh, Malcolm Boyd, um, Morris Kite, William Federman. Uh, but here with me live, I'm very pleased to introduce you to my uh, two guests who we're going to talk to mostly today. Uh, first, on uh, my left, uh, I guess yours too, I'm never quite sure how this works, Ivy Bottini, who's been a longtime activist in our lesbian community, uh, way back when it was just a lesbian community and now in the lesbian and gay community. And she is the managing editor of the community Yellow Pages and a longtime realtor is her profession. And uh, my other guest today is Jack Stafford, who is a member of the Choctaw Nation and who has been very active with Dignity LA and with Dignity USA. And welcome to both of you. I'm really glad you're here with me today. It's very I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> Good, I hope you will be. It's really actually sort of fun. Uh, this show is really a show in which we kind of talk about um, the issues in our own community. It's kind of one of the few places where we sort of talk on the air, very much the way we talk among ourselves, I think. And so I guess my, my first question to you today is, um, uh, how is it different being, uh, let's say, an elder in the gay and lesbian community than it was uh, being a, a younger, I don't know what the opposite of elder is. Does it feel different in terms of your place in the community, the way you think about yourself in the community, Ivy? Oh, very different. Um, first of all, the big difference is I never thought I'd be one <laughs> um, or, or be thought of as one. The other difference for me is that all the years that I was active, um, and I've been sort of out of the loop for about five years by choice, and but all the other years, uh, I was always in the thick of it. I was always um, going to meeting, 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 meetings, you know, and have, being able now to step back out and look at it, it's 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 so clear to me how we talk in circles every time we begin something new. We go through the same process over and over and over again. And I'm at the point in my life where I want the people who need to do all the process, let them do it, and then I'll come back, you know. <laughs> Call I'll, me when it's I'll, over. <laughs> yeah, I'll swing by later, you know, and come in when everything's sort of ready to go. And and um, I don't feel like, like I, you know, that I'm above any of that, but I don't seem to have the patience any longer as I get older. The, mm -hmm. other, the other nice part, about getting older for me is that there's a um, a calmness to my life that wasn't there before. Um, it's how does that happen when we still seem to have all the same junk going on that was going on? Well, the junk isn't as important anymore. You know what's important for me now is that I have good friends. I have my family connection to my daughters and my grandson. I like to watch him grow. And I watch the community as it moves through the process that I went through for so many years. And so it's, it's one of more of observation than participation. And then I get to choose when I want to participate. I'm not driven to participate as I used to be. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be totally in charge anymore. No. I mean, not that you ever had to be. Of course, you were a non-hierarchist and a collective worker, I remember. Right, yes. <laughs> Weren't we all? I was a big coalition person. Yes, you know? of course. Still am. How about you, Jack? Same for you? Well, I've always been an activist. Before the gay lesbian, it was the uh, farm workers and, uh, when I was young. And I think uh, during that time, I was really closeted. Uh, but as I... I get older, you have a lot of freedom to make choices. You have freedom to uh, say yes and say no and really not care what people think. So the gay activism is a natural place to move into. Through my involvement with uh, various gay and lesbian organizations, uh, starting many years ago as a volunteer at the center when it had its uh, 
uh, STD a VD clinic on Wilshire Boulevard. That's, wow. not from far. that's way back. That's then. way back. Uh-huh. Uh, started at that point, and then working, of course, with Dignity Los Angeles, in various activist points, and still active from my gay side, and also in the uh, larger community with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I'm on the board as an American Indian huh. uh, for Los Angeles, so it's uh, you're able to interface both communities. I think the one thing I missed that I always wish I were younger is today I think the the youth and the young adults are coming into a world as for as far as gay and lesbian that uh, is uh, much strange for us because there is so much freedom and there's so many things that you can do so many opportunities that when uh, I'd be at an age of youth in the early 20s uh, they just weren't there you know you were hiding on the bars and uh, it was still a point of um, it was before the Stonewall and before we as uh, a people stood up and uh, said, you got to listen to us. So I, a lot of times I hear us talk about shame and, you know, the shame of hiding and that we're trying to convert sort of to pride. Is that did you feel shame? As a young person about being gay? Well, I think as a teenager, of course, you always go through that. You feel uh, shame about everything. About teenager, everything. Right? But, uh, you know, probably much more so than young people today, but I think they have their own uh, troubles and burdens they have to bear in, in, in the coming out process. And, and I think the first coming out process is accepting yourself as who you are and uh, not worrying about the rest of the world. You know, uh, One of the things we've heard is that um, people characterize our... Uh, community as uh, being sort of hung up on youth as a, a, a youth culture. Although I think much more among the men than among the women, I've heard that. Although we might comment that it's pretty much the same in terms I of think what we care about. I think it's changing. It's it's. Um, I've always seen the the male community as more hung up on youth and more um, objectifying bodies, and you have to look good. And I think. Now I'm seeing also that happening in the young lesbian community. Hmm. I think there's a looksism hmm. that's starting to move into the lesbian community that wasn't there before. It's different. Um, I I I think there's a lot of you know years ago there was a lot of butch femme stuff right. and it was it was very very clear. And I think we're kind of going back to that on some level, huh. because the femmes are getting femmier, uh-huh, you know, yeah. the young ones, and and the young, um, more androgynous lesbian, they're getting more butchier, you huh. know. They're, but they're all very well dressed and groomed. But there really is this real division in in look in looks. Well, I know that you've talked about the the difference between the sort of what you called the assimilationists and the uh, affirmationists, as it were. I mean, do you see this um, uh, this sort of move toward, I, I, I don't know whether it's femme liberation or, you know, I am what I am, I'm gonna look the way I look, I like, I enjoy being a girl, you know? I mean, I went to a show and they were singing this mm-hmm. song as a kind of defiant kind of thing, right? Whether that's, you see, but you don't seem to think that's a very good thing. Um. I see our community in a, in a real kind of struggle between affirmation of who we are and assimilation to be able to pass, being who we are, but still being able to pass in that world out there. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, I, I think a lot of the um, the younger people coming up really feel we've achieved what we've wanted to achieve. And I don't think they grasp the gravity of the situation. Uh, it's been pretty easy. When 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 you're younger and you're coming out, it's been much easier than it was back there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also think there's a whole bunch of mystery that's been lost because it is easy to come out. I mean, when 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 I was coming out, uh, there there was more of a mystery of, about our community. You mean it was a, like a mysterious kind of uh, yeah, it was like a cool thing to be. Yeah, kind yeah. of cool, <laughs> kind of. Um, it was a, a clan of a, a private people. Um, there was a, um, um, I don't know, it was like it was mine, and not everybody could get in, you know, and there was that kind of fun mystery about it, and that's sort of dropping away. And on one hand, it's very good, and on the other hand, I think the assimilation can take place so much easier because it's so much easier to come out that we're going to start passing out in that world out there and we're going to lose um, I think our identity and people being able to see us and understand us and and know we're there. Do you see a youth culture? I'm sorry, whatever you were going to say. I was going to add on to that. I, uh, 
when I was growing up, uh, men only were, you know, the boys and young men, you were uh, blue jeans, uh, only certain colors. Today, you can wear anything. I think that's great. Mm-hmm. I wish I were back, uh, back uh, 30 years later so I could wear anything. But I uh, took a nephew of mine to uh, one of the gay bars. It was uh, one of the Western bars. And as we walked in, uh, he looked, because I think most people, most gay and lesbian people, assimilate. You know, uh, he was, what is this? Until he turn, turned uh, to the left and looked and saw all these men dancing together. Mm. Uh, but he said, this just looked like a regular bar in Oklahoma. And I think that's the truth of, of many of us. We just fell into the woodwork. You know, it's like you take people to uh, a gay establishment and they're so shocked because they're stereotyped of uh, who's gay or lesbian. Mm-hmm. It's so set in their mind. They expect to see an effeminate or a drag queen or very much uh, uh, dykes on bikes. That's their main reference to gay and lesbian. We're actually, we're all the same. I mean, some of us uh, dress whatever our gig is. See, I think the danger is before, um, you were able, I mean, people, you know, heterosexual people, if they were attuned at all, were at least able to say, hmm, I wonder if if she's lesbian, I wonder if he's gay. And so that we were on their minds, we were in their face Mm -hmm. before, Mm -hmm. years ago. Now we're not. I mean, heterosexuals can work next to gays and lesbians and never have a clue as to who we are, and I think that's bad. Except because I, we pass so much and we don't come out. But in those days, everybody was passing too. I mean, mm-hmm. there was a small group of us or of you who were um, who were out, who knew who you were. A lot of lesbians were, you know, very much in, in your face about their stuff, and very much outsiders. That was our role. We were to be the outsiders. We were social critics. We were founders of uh, probably every social justice movement in the country because as an outsider it's easier to be a social critic right. but there were still those 50 gazillion people working next to everybody at the desks mm-hmm. looking like everybody else but we were assimilated there, were, there were some of us who were not looking right. like everybody else right now we're, now we're getting to everybody starting to look like everybody else well you know the other thing is and i think it's a thing that um, we were talking about there's a, a funny shame in 90 percent of the community mm-hmm. about the very people who fomented the stonewall rebellion you know, the drag queens and the dykes on bikes, et, et cetera, that it's sort of like, oh, we don't want them in our parade because right. everybody, you know, they look funny. Right. Um, but it's really a function of any oppressed people, I think, that you say, we don't want that oppression. And what can we do? How how can we be very, very good people so we won't be oppressed? And one of the answers is, well, don't remind us that you're queer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, dress like us, talk like us, uh, don't have a picture of your of your lover of 25 years on your desk. You know, just don't be there. On the other hand, I see a lot more of us who are just regular people saying, no, I'm not going to hide anymore. going to be just who I am and the picture of my lover will go on my desk. So it's sort of... See, I'm not seeing that. Yeah. Just, but then, but then I'm, I'm, I'm in kind of a... Um, I'm, in, I'm in kind of a secluded world. You know, being a real estate agent, I deal with, with my agents in my own office and I know who they are but it's not like another company where you have other people mm-hmm. coming and going in different and in and the clients most of my clients come from the community mm-hmm. uh, so I know who they are but I I live kind of in rarefied air you know um, I deal with clients who are of our community and um, and now I'm working for a community yellow pages at least through the year uh, and again it's a lesbian and a gay atmosphere mm-hmm so I don't see a lot of that outside, but what I'm seeing in our own community when I go socialize, you know, out mm-hmm. to dances and things like that, that's when I'm seeing the assimilation look right. very strong, you know, in girl bar and mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. You know, the, um, the question of respect for elders, uh, everybody says sort of that's not happening anywhere. Although I know when we were talking, Jack, you were talking about in the uh, Native American or indigenous people's communities, it's really different, isn't it? Well, as with age, a great deal of respect comes uh, just by the fact that you have survived uh, so many years. Uh, not so long ago for American Indians, senior citizen age was 45 because our uh, 
life expectancy rate was so short compared to other groups within the United States. They've now raised that up to 55, and uh, uh, so that uh, as a senior citizen, because of the, the uh, increase in the life expectancy for American Indians. But for those who have survived and survived the Great Wars, as we always uh, talk and then our own people about, yes, growing older has been a benefit for the status within the community and the respect, even from the young people, because in our tribal sides, and, they, and to remember there's 350 different tribes in the United States, but this is something that is common amongst all tribes, is that elders have the wisdom and the gift to uh, give to the people, all the people. And there's a way of seeking that wisdom, right? I mean, you can ask your elders something. I mean, it's I always picture it as being some sort of familial availability. It's like sometimes I uh, use a traditional dance because we're from uh, Oklahoma, uh, the southern we call it straight dance has nothing to do with it. Was it? It's an old <laughs> warrior's dance, actually. It was for older men. And uh, not too long ago, I was at a uh, powwow, we call our dances, and uh, a young man came and said, could I dance next to you? And it's because uh, he's wanted to become a straight dancer. Mm -hmm. wanted to dance that style. And in that costume and a regalia that uh, typifies a straight dancer. And he just picked me out of the many there that he wanted to emulate and in that. So and he, he wouldn't do that as a young person. Right. He'd always go to an older man or an older woman to... Uh, so the notion of the role model is a real one. I mean, right. that is not just a role, but also a skill, mm -hmm. um, uh, various kinds of talent to be passed right. on, almost like an apprenticeship. So we don't see is, that in our... I think, again, let's be in uh, the dominant culture society, We and, and that's not even just within our own. Uh, throughout our society, uh, age has always been, or for many, many years, looked upon as something le better, uh, less than, uh, not as good as. I right. mean, you're on your declining years, so right, decline. move over and let the exactly. young ones move in. Uh, well, let me, stop, let me stop you there, because we're going to have another time to talk, but I uh, want to go to a break. I don't want you to go away, because... Father Malcolm Boyd is going to uh, join our discussion, not live, but on tape. Um, so we'll be right back. Bobby Griffith died at the age of 20. He didn't have a disease. He wasn't involved in gang violence or drugs. Bobby Griffith killed himself because he was gay. Bobby Griffith's mother is a good Christian woman. She didn't mean for her son to die so tragically, but like so many others, she allowed herself to believe the bigotry that led to her young son's death. Love and support your gay and lesbian children. That's what Mary Griffith would do if only she and Bobby could start over. Conference, because it was, uh, I don't know if it's the first time that that's ever been done. I don't know. Oh, hi, where have you been? Um, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome back to Get Used to It. Today we're talking about aging in our community. Uh, and I'm pleased my guests here in the studio are Ivy Bottini, a longtime lesbian feminist activist, founder of uh, the New York chapter of Now. Did you know I knew that? Hey, pretty good. And uh, managing editor of our community, Yellow Pages, and Jack Stafford, who's a member of the Choctaw Nation and a longtime activist and worker with Dignity LA and Dignity USA. But now I'd like to take you to the conference for a bit of a discussion with Father Malcolm Boyd, also a longtime activist and Episcopal priest and author of the best-selling book, Are You Running With Me, Jesus? Here's Malcolm Boyd. I recently turned 70, which uh, is an age. You know, I remember turning 30. That was hell, because there wasn't life after 30. 40 went by very easily. 50 was a horror for me. Because uh, I didn't belong anywhere. At 50, you're no longer young and you're not old and uh, people don't know what to do with you. 60 was just kind of a bore. Uh, 70 was okay, but I, it's a biggie. And then you start realizing that uh, you've got to be thinking about what's coming in terms of health, in terms of money, in terms of your rights. Uh, these, you know, I mean, we don't know where any of us is going to be. So do you think about your own legacy to our community uh, in terms of a precise legacy or and, and things that you have still left to do? I have mixed feelings about that because at one level, of course, at another level, I don't want to get so self-conscious about it that I'm an egomaniac. 
and it would be very easy to become that. Uh, in a way, my books are my children, uh, and there are like 25 of them, and there's a certain legacy there. Uh, you know, I have letters from Australia and Germany and Japan and every place, and that's nice. That's part of it. I think more of a living legacy might be my relationship with my life partner and lover. Uh, in other words, we have an ongoing life together that I think says something. You're also a kind of pioneer, uh, not that you chose it or, or anyone has. But can you evaluate that? It is true right now with some of us that we've been there for quite a long time and we continue to be there. And the, shall I dare I see the word role model? You, you, you try to honor it. You said earlier that turning 50 uh, was difficult for you. You were neither young nor old, uh, but clearly you've survived it. And uh, tell us, what, what was it that brought you to the, the joy following that? When I was young, <laughs> sounds like an old movie. <laughs> but that was another ball game. One was beautiful in a certain sense, and life was very glamorous and romantic. And you, there weren't problems of a sort. There were problems of a broken romance, and maybe you needed a new job. But God, you'd hit, get one in 10 minutes. But uh, people were treated me differently at 50 because I was no longer the young romantic, just the pretty boy, nor was I the elder who might have a little dignity and there might be a little respect. Uh, it was nothing. It was, it was almost invisible or at a checkout counter, people weren't pleasant. Now they kind of crinkle their eyes if you're a little older and that you're this, you, you know. You're <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that a productive time in spite of all of that? Well, or in maybe terms of growing, of it? it was productive because I, I had to work through all that stuff. I had to uh, get to another level of self-esteem. I think self-esteem is always the issue with us. Always. Always the issue because, a, I'm sorry. Well, I grew up without any as a young gay boy when there wasn't, I mean, were there any other gay boys? Uh, there were no publications, there were no media. I was so lonely and, and I had a hell of a terribly dysfunctional childhood. And, and that's part of the story. And, and, and my self-esteem was so low, you know, because there wasn't anything to bolster it. And in coming out, when I did, uh, I finally got the self-esteem to the level where it was good news to share, and I wanted to share it, and I came out. So, uh, so uh, there was another self-esteem problem at 50. It's a little easier now. I feel enormous self-esteem about being uh, older and elder. Paul Manette referred to me recently as an elder of the tribe. Um, great. I buy that. Uh, I, uh, there's a lot of self-esteem in that. I feel great being older, incidentally. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of beauty in age, and I see it in myself and in others. And uh, I'm fine with, with, uh, with all of this. I'm not cringing in some corner, and I'm not a has-been, and I'm not over the hill, and I have no intention of being, you know? I'm very active and vital. I'm not retiring. <laughs> I'm in an intergenerational relationship with a life partner who's 41. That's interesting too, in many ways. He's HIV positive. And that means that uh, in a sense, we don't know who will go first. Right, you may think about your life span somewhat in the same way. Well, you know, it's made me look at death very differently because I used to really fear death and mortality and it, it didn't quite understand it. But now I've had a wonderful life and do. And at the time I go, it's no big deal. We also had the privilege while we were at the conference of having a discussion with uh, two other longtime activists in our community. Maurice Kite, who was one of the founders of the LA Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, and who's also a commissioner on the Human Relations Commission of LA County. And Lillian Faderman, Professor Lillian Faderman, who has written some of our favorite books, um, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers, and Surpassing the Love of Men. Here are Morris and Lillian having a wonderful dialogue with each other.
So when you say we're a family, you mean among all the ages? I think what what's most important to me is that for those of us who can perceive that we're all a family, it's very positive. Many of us need that. I think there are many people within our lesbian and gay communities that, that don't have precisely that perception. I think their feeling is that there are class differences in the community or there are racial and ethnic differences. And so what's important to them is that they bond as a family with people that are more closely connected in terms of class, in terms of race or ethnicity. And that's fine as long as we all get together to make common cause when we have common enemies out there. I think we need to realize that no matter what our class is, no matter what, what our race or ethnicity is, because we're gay or lesbian, people hate us for that. People make life miserable for us because of that. And and it's necessary, I think, that that we bond in the face of our enemies. What I, I think we need to recognize is a kind of unity within diversity. I think it's really dangerous to erase differences, to say that because we're gay and lesbian, we're all alike. Clearly, we're not all alike, but we all have a relationship that's very important, and that relationship comes out of those who define us, those who try to make life miserable for us. How do you see this working in your in your own lives, in terms of the, the aspect that we expect from our families, being, for instance, being taken care of when we're older? I think what, what happens within lesbian relationships, and I, I don't think it happens quite that way or quite that much in heterosexual relationships, is that very often we have a kind of um, serial monogamy, that is relationships go on for a period of time and then they're over, but we don't throw each other away when they're over. The, the person who was our lover last year becomes our best friend or one of our closest friends forever. And we continue that, that contact. We don't live together anymore, but, but we have holidays together. We exchange letters. We, we have frequent telephone calls. And I think that's one way that, that we make family that's so important and so vital. But something else has been happening in the lesbian community within the last few years that I think is is really important, and that is that many of us choose to um, create more conventional kinds of families. And what I mean by that is through donor insemination, many lesbians have decided to have babies within the last decade or so. My son is um, he's 18 and a half, so I'd like to say within the last two decades, but there wasn't a baby boom when, when I decided to have donor insemination. There is now, and there are all sorts of instances of lesbian families that are made up of, of a lesbian, often her partner, and one or two or sometimes more children. And it, I, I think it's very exciting that we're realizing now that that's an option for us. That's another kind of family that we can have. Do you think about your own legacies, about a, a body of, of work in your life, the meaning of your life, kind of uh, what you might want to say or leave behind? Well, when I come home from New York, from Stonewall 25, where I expect to be very gay and dancing in the streets of New York, I intend to write a book about how bad it was. It was not gay to be gay before 1969. Historical revisionists and reconstructionists, indeed revanchists, have been rewriting our ancient history as if there were a great movement of tea parties and cocktails. Nonsense. There was blight. It was blind terror. You could associate with a circle of acquaintances and be out to them. But the moment you went beyond the pale, and dealt 
in that society, you stood a chance of being arrested or lobotomized or cured or any variety of things. So I intend to write about that. I believe that being one of the architects of modern lesbian gay liberation, that while I still have the recall, and happily I have total recall, I want to write about that. It was a majestic time. There were people who said, I'm just not going to take it anymore. Carolyn Heilbrunn has written that she thinks having a croning ceremony at 50 is an important thing. And uh, we've been called pretty much of a youth culture in our, in our movement, uh, seems to be what we value. Do you think that we ought to somehow encourage the celebration of our aging and maybe some kind of ceremony? When I first came out in, um, in the 1950s, my experience was with the bar culture and of course, in the bars, uh, there were no women over 35. I, I, was, I was still a teenager, in fact. And it really seemed to me that if you're a lesbian and you're over 35, you die or you go off to live on Mars or, or you're institutionalized or whatever. The other um, public manifestation of lesbian life in the 1950s was in, with the softball games. And of course, there were no lesbians over 35 in the softball games either. And so it was, it was very hard for me as a young lesbian to envision what it would be like to be old. And it was very scary. It was very scary to realize that I was undertaking a a life that seemed to have a limited future. But I think things have, have changed for, for young lesbians nowadays. And I think that's partly because many of us who were young lesbians in the 50s and 60s and 70s are not young lesbians anymore, and yet we're, we're still active. We're out there, our image is out there, we're, we're writing, we're talking about what it's like to become older and old, and I think all of that is very healthy. We need to continue to, to talk about it. So is there anything you'd like to add about uh, this old notion that you have to be young to have energy, which clearly you don't, as I've seen, or uh, your place in our movement? I think older and old lesbians have voices that are very valuable. I think we really need in the movement to hear from them. We're, we're only going to exist to continue to grow as a movement if we bring in all of these voices. The, the people who started the gay and lesbian movement in the 1960s are now not only older, many of them are old. We have to continue to hear their voices in the movement. We have to uh, make young people speak to us, uh, high school students, uh, uh, young adults in their early 20s. We really have to incorporate all voices if we're going to exist as a movement, as a community, if we're going to continue the kinds of, of advances that we've made, the incredible advances that we've made in the last 25 years. I think we should welcome our young, younger, youthful uh, lesbian sisters and gay brothers to the garden. We should open the garden gate and say, you're welcome to come in. A and we, they need to recognize that we have or to inside the to garden stay gate, keeping too. the gate. A weed is a flower that has not yet been named or welcomed into the garden. So we've got all those weeds to come in and become flowers. Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. This is Get Used to It. You're watching our show about aging in the community. And after the upcoming break, we're going to come back and talk to Ivy Patini and Jack Stafford. We'll be right back. I don't want any trouble. You got a problem, faggot? I'm not gonna fight you. Oh yeah? Stop. 
Pick up your telephone right now and call the number on your screen. Find out how you can enrich your family values by learning about your gay children. We had no idea what the gay community was like. Learn how these parents deal with their fears about attending parents' flag meetings. One of my biggest fears was that I would see someone that I knew. Call the telephone number on your screen right now and see how these parents have taken themselves to acceptance and beyond. Because that parent does not know the positives yet about the gay community. Part a little bit about um, our. Oh, welcome back. This is Get Used to It. We're talking to Ivy Bettini and Jack Stafford. Um, one of the issues that I think, and maybe it's in my 50s, I think about this, um, is sort of what the future feels like. Uh, you were talking about how people sort of mischaracterize aging as declining, as being less than or whatever, but there really are some real issues around health and care, don't you think? Well, for me, the um, the thing that, that I'm concerned about is will my body last as long as my mind? The answer is no. <laughs> I can tell and, you that right and, now. And that bothers me yeah. because I'm, um, I mean, I think I'm sharper than I was, you know, years ago. Uh, I've got a lot more stuff going on in my head and a lot more um, profound thoughts that float around. But I can I can feel my my body getting older, and it's like I don't know how you stop that. I keep going. Well, I'll go to the gym. Well, you know, I never get there. Um, so that that worries me. That's the only thing that does worry me. Does um, it seem scary then, in terms of what will happen as uh, the, sort of the body fails us? Yeah. You know? Well, I've always kind of kidded around saying if 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 my body fails me, I'm going to get a four on the floor chrome fender wheelchair, mm. you know, and really kind of be hot, you know, cool and, and, and that kind of thing. But I mean, I don't, I don't know. I had a bum knee for a few months uh, last year and like three months and I hated not being able to get around. I mean, it really got to me psychologically. Um, I hated using a cane. Uh, I hated limping. I hated, not being able to go up and down stairs when I wanted to go up and down stairs. I hated having to ask somebody to get something for me. I don't do that well. Um, so yeah, that does bother me. That, that bothers me a lot as to what's going to happen. That hasn't struck me too much yet. I've, um, <clears throat> maybe it's uh, the illusion I put up. The, I still think I'm in my uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, you know, in my mind's Speaking eye. Speaking of youth culture. Right. <laughs> <laughs> in my mind's eye, even though there are limitations as you get older. Your body, you know, a little arthritis here in the mornings, it's a little rougher getting up. But I think that looking at that other side, it's just something that has not, for me personally, been something I have taken a lot of time or preoccupation with my time of thinking about. Uh, I think probably very few do until well, you start maybe really experiencing those things that are debilitating and maybe possibly long term. Jack, you also have been in a long-term relationship that you're still in. Maybe there's a difference. I mean, maybe you take for granted to some extent that somebody will be there for you. And I wonder whether this is an issue for our community. I wanted to see how you feel about this sort of personally in your own lives, but also as you see the community, because we don't build the same kinds of families, or, and we're certainly not encouraged to or supported for doing that. And our relationships aren't supported. Right. Right. I mean, that I think is one of the big differences. When you're out, and, and I was married for 16 years, and I have two grown daughters, and I've got a grandson, you know, I could mention that all the time. Yeah. But um, back there, society supports the institution of marriage. Here, um, rather than getting support for your relationship, if there's any trouble that seems to be brewing, it becomes a thing to gossip about in the community and the vultures to come in and really try and see if they can break it up mm. uh, because somehow it's, it's, I mean, our community is kind of strange because on one hand, we like to see long-term relationships and on the other hand, it makes us feel less than if we don't have one and so we're, we're constantly either going yay or boo, right. you know, about long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. But if when when you when you have a breakup, it's it's almost like you don't want the community to know because there's a lot of why did that happen? We heard this, we heard that, which is different out there in that heterosexual world. 
you know, you so like, you know, oh, don't stay in this, stay in your marriage because you've got the kids. This is all go, you know, it all go away, and you want to watch your kids grow up. But here, it's like, oh, oh you don't, yeah. oh, you're not happy. Oh, get out. Yeah, get out. A little more truthful though. Yeah. I yes. mean, you know, in a uh, uh, heterosexual relationship, like you say, oh, wait for the kids. You know, we'll stay together because of the kids. In a uh, in lesbian relationships, I think we'd be more when a relationship has ended, it's ended, and there doesn't have to be these false barriers of what society thinks. So maybe that's but, more helpful. But, but see, I'm not sure relationships have ended when they end in our in in our community. Um, we, we, our community has lived, I think, for many many years on the high of falling in love, on the high of uh, passion. And when the passion starts to drift off, which it does in any relationship, then we think the relationship is over or there's something wrong. And rather than saying, okay, it's moving into the next stage, let's see where it goes. So I think that I think that's a, a big problem where our community seems to be hung up on, on uh, passion. You know, if passion is not there every minute, then there's got to be something wrong. Sure. And that's wrong. Well, and the and the implication for me really goes to I I I, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm assuming that you have a kind of a gee, I don't think about who's going to be there for me because less is going to be there for me. You right. might think. And after 25 years, it's taken for granted. And right. I think at that point, you get to the point. Well, who else is going to put up with either one of us? So we stay, you know, <laughs> like old pair of shoes. You get comfortable with the person that you after this length of time. Passion does change. Change. But it might be a little more scary for people. I mean, I, I assume there are a number of gay men who are not in long-term relationships. Uh, often they have maybe a young lover at the moment, but who knows if you can count on that guy to be around when you're really you know, ill and you have to be taken to the hospital, although our community has a lot of experience with that in its youth. Now, now, so that I don't know what impact that will have on ha on thinking about our aging and and our illness. I don't well, think we're unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've done any work in convalescent homes and retirement homes, you see hundreds upon hundreds of heterosexual people that have really been isolated and forgotten by their own families, even when they have children. So it's an area, I don't know, we can uh, sometimes just uh, planning for the future, you know, socking away the dough, or uh, probably would be the easiest uh, way to look at it. Well, we have these fantasies about old dyke homes, don't we? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know, oh, we're always yes. talking about, oh, we're going to buy a house, six of us are going to live together, and, you know, we'll take care. Actually, I think that may happen. The other joke, of course, in the lesbian community is that our families are generally made up of our ex-lovers, <laughs> you know, and frankly, I don't know, in the activist community, an army of ex-lovers well, wouldn't be so bad. Many, uh, in dignity, some of our members, uh, we have uh, many of the, as we call the geriatric wards, are talking about, uh, you know, what about uh, developing, maybe uh, purchasing a, a, an apartment building that we could rent to uh, people as they age and need community. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking more like you know, leisure world. Right. Not <laughs> just Something one, big. Right, big. Not just one, but several. Mm -hmm. several leisure worlds for lesbian and gay people. Um, and and this talk has been around the community for years, but this is the first time in the history of the lesbian and gay community that you could, act, or the movement, that you can actually see the aging of a movement. Right. I mean, it has never happened before. So all of a sudden, we're faced with a lot of the movers and shakers who began this being down at this end and nowhere to go, no money to support them because many of, of the of the of the real movers and shakers have devoted their life to activism and haven't been out socking money away. They've been living as movement workers do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole population, and especially in the young lesbians, years ago, when when they felt isolated from the community anyway, from that world out there, they became plumbers and handy people and truck drivers and and so they weren't putting money in social you security. You had an example of that that you were telling me about. Yes, there's Tell a, that story. there's a woman in my church who who is in her seventies now, and she's on two canes. She is the most wonderful woman I've known her for years in the community. She shoots a great game of pool, and but she has really nothing now. She's living on dis disability. 
um, a very small check a month. She lives in one room with her dog, probably spends more money on the dog food than she does on her own uh, food. But she she came up a truck driver, you know, handy person, um, just to make a living because she was, you know, of the young butchers. And now she hasn't, over the years, put anything in Social Security. Mm -hmm. She has nothing put away. And she is in serious trouble, serious trouble. And th and that's not an isolated case. I mean, I look at the young lesbians in the community, the ones who, who are doing the non-traditional work, not the ones who are out there assimilating into the corporate world, but, but, but the non-traditional lesbian who's out there doing, you know, the non-traditional stuff. Uh, her own carpentry. Yeah. Right here. And, and whenever I can talk to them, I say, look, you need to put money in Social Security. Even even if you're self-employed, put money and send money in. You know, be your own employer because you're going to need that later. Our community has a way of spending today's money and not worrying about tomorrow's money. This and, is an experience, though. Uh, this aging factor within a defined community, because up until uh, the '60s, really, we weren't that well defined. Uh, a new experience within it. So. It, uh, this is probably some issue that's going to have to be addressed. I think this is a Project Rainbow in uh, for the older, I think in San Diego they have SAGE and uh, mm -hmm. different groups to start addressing for the senior citizen or the older gay and lesbian person. And that may have to take in the more activist role of, of housing, having low income housing that is addressed to our community and not just a... Um, you know, long waiting list to go into one of uh, full of heterosexuals that you have nothing in common with at all. Are there special issues for people in our community who are aging? I mean, I was trying to sort of identify because I was thinking about the sort of chosen families rather than often having our own sort of families of origin or but often having both. One of the criticisms of our, our community has been that we have not been good at um, linkages and development of extended families, you know, short, very short, as in with many relationships, even the everyday uh, relationships with various people are short lived, uh, in many cases, not all. So you don't develop an extended family that's going to support you or be there as a support unless you belong to different groups. You know, it's like we in Dignity, we have a somewhat of a support. We bury our own and we take care of, you know, at least visiting uh, those who are coming into that age. You know, we have people that are in the upper 70s that are very active, but they and that we became a community for them. Well, the key to it seems maybe to be that to sort of break through the denial that we have all the way up into our 60s that we need to do anything to prepare. I mean, if it wasn't for Social Security, I wouldn't have put money in. You know, they took it out of my check. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought right. in my 20s and 30s, oh, gee, I better save for my retirement. Yeah. And you don't find a bunch of us doing IRAs uh, in those years. You start to in your 40s, you think, well, you know, maybe. But it seems like what you're saying is that we ought to think about this, that it's it's not a scary thing. It's just another phase of life that one needs to prepare for. I think we always think, well, we're going to die before we get to that point. <laughs> I, you know, I really do. We'll pass on. But so many of us are living, you know, far past the uh, life expectancy rate of when we were young. You know, uh, we were too discussing earlier about where is senior citizen? Like with Native Americans, it was 45, you know, not, not so long ago, 10 years ago. Now it's up to 55. Well, it's uh, the same issue with uh, those in the 60s are no longer considered so much old. They are still middle-aged. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're active and they're, they are they have their faculties and their bodies willing, uh, they're considered middle-aged now. You're not old. And, and I think um, women are still very badly discriminated against in the workplace. Uh, especially if you're working for companies and corporations, because uh, you you become like a uh, discarded piece of Kleenex as you get older. So I've I've talked for a number of years about women in general, young women in general, should try to get their own business, be self-employed, so that they are employing themselves, and that no one can tell them to get out when they hit 60 or 62 or 54, so that they have their own base, they've made their own economic security. Um, I mean, women have serviced society forever, and and then at the end, we'll let go. We're phased out, 
And as lesbians, we don't have those families to phase back into. So I'm, I'm very, very adamant about, uh, especially lesbians, getting their own, their own feet on the ground economically with their own business. You know, I know a number of activists who are freaked out about getting older. Um, they're not quite there yet, but they're, you know, in their 40s or early 50s. I mean, really, look in the mirror and go, oh, my God. They can do nothing about it. That's true. You know, the train keeps rolling. Well, and, I'm, as, uh, I'm as young today as I'm ever going right. to be. That's what I think, you know, and so that that's sort of good news. But what would you say to them? I mean, both as long-term activists, um, to the activists in our community, to the, you know, the rest of the people watching the show, who say, I'm you. scared of it. I, I really think life... I wouldn't want to go back to be uh, 30. What I do today is something that I never did when I was 30. I have I have the options. I'm not living with options that are given to me. And I think that's important. That uh, and we have uh, an accumulation of knowledge that we have over the years that. Um, Nothing's going to surprise you. Nothing's new. It's all there. Just may take a different color, a different form, but it's all the same. And we have that option. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't feel I don't feel my age, so I don't think of myself as as getting. I'm 67. I just had a birthday, and so, but I don't feel 67, whatever that feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, I I somehow still feel like I'm back in my 40s. Not not the chronicle, chronological thing, but that sense of myself. Right. Um, but there is more of a calmness, and and I do have do have choices. I've decided I'm never going to retire. That I'm always going to work. Uh, I don't know what I do if I retire. I mean, I would be, just be bored out of my mind, because I've always I've always my jobs have always been something that have been fun to do. I've never had a job where I hated to go to. So I've sort of played my life away. Hmm. And that's what I'm still doing. And and if what I'm doing today, I'm not having a good time, if, if it's not fun, then I will go do something else. That's just the way I've lived my life. So I will always work because I will still be playing down there. I've worn a hearing aid for 10 years. And a lot of people... Um, Women have come up to me in the last two, three years, especially, and said, "Is that a hearing aid?" You know, like with the you say no. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I want no, to say, speak, speak up by my ear. Yeah, speak up. I have a hearing aid. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, they, they go, well, you know, aren't you? And I, no, I'm not embarrassed. I'm. I'd be embarrassed if I didn't have it anymore because because I, you couldn't hear. I go what a lot, right. you know. Well, let me. I I can't imagine how the time went by so fast, but it did. So. Let me thank you both for being here very much and for doing that conference and for the work you're doing. Ivy Bettini, Jack Stafford, thanks very much. I hope to see you uh, next time you tune in our show. And remember uh, about any of these issues, just get used to it. (laughs) 